The next talk is going to be by Diomodos Spinellis from Essence University of Economics and Business. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Unix will be 50 in a couple of years. This is more than most people in this room. A lot has happened through those years, in the 1980s and 1990s. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. A lot has happened through these years in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, in this century. How has the architecture of Unix changed? This is what I will discuss today. So I will describe the groundwork about Unix. I will describe the sources I will be using, important architectural milestones, evolution in numbers, and evolution in words. I will start from Thompson and Ritchie programming a PDP-11 through a typewriter in the 1970s to Bill Joy and the group, the CSRG team, hacking Unix on a VAX in the 1980s to this century's modern open source communities. Unix was born in the AT&T Bell Laboratories, an amazing place home to eight Nobel Prizes, three Turing Awards, radio astronomy and cosmic radiation, transatlantic cables, the transistor, the charged couple devices being the cameras in all our phones, the communications theory, lasers, solar cells, the C, C++, and the OCK programming languages, fiber optics, and CDMA telephony. It started its life when another project called Multix, that was going on in the 1960s at MIT with AT&T, Bell Labs, and General Electric, folded, didn't go as well as AT&T expected. And so Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and Doug McIlroy, and Joe Osana went off and developed an unnamed system on a PDP-7, a much smaller computer. Based on their work, which looked promising, they created a funding proposal for a word processing facility, of all things, because Bell Labs was typesetting patents, to work on a PDP-11. The history of what followed was very co long and very complex. Why is this all important? First of all, because of the exemplar design of Unix, its technical contribution, its impact on all of us. All of us have some device on us probably running some sort of Unix or a system developed on its ideas. The development model it used, and I will describe that. It's very interesting how open source came into that model. It's widespread use. And in the words of Doug McIlroy, it's unusual simplicity, power, and elegance. As a recognition of these achievements, its developers received the US President's Medal. Regarding technology, what has Unix given us? First of all, a hierarchical file system. Compatible I.O. for files, for devices, for networking, and for interprocess I.O. The pipes and filters architecture. Virtual file systems. The shell as a user-selectable regular process, anything that we can change and use. Also, a number of technologies were associated with Unix. C and C++ parse and lexical analyzer generators, software development environments, document preparation tools such as Tiroff and uh, the, its cousins, declarative markup, scripting languages, TCP IP networking all around us again, configuration management systems. They form the Unix systems form a large part of the modern internet infrastructure and the world around us. The evolution I will describe is based on three sources. First of all, the availability of Unix sources that goes back to decisions uh, and uh, decision by Caldera to open early sources. And based on that material, I've created a repository that records the history and the evolution of Unix. I did that to record the evolution of programming style, to consolidate artifacts that were, uh, I thought, very important, to record the recent history that is fading away, and to provide a place where any of, one of us can go there and look at the history. So this is a rough diagram of what it contains. These here are snapshots of various editions. And these again, at some point at Berkeley, they started using the source code control system. So there, there was a version control system where versions are recorded. But there are also snapshots. And it goes down through open source editions, 386 BSD, a patch kit. And then I continued the path of free BSD. I could equally well continue on open BSD or net BSD. The source really goes back to the 1970s. Here I've run git blame on a, file, a specific file of the C library. 
You see there are changes that have happened in 2009, and you see that there are also changes that have happened in 1979 by Dennis Ritchie. So on the same repository, if you run git blame on it, you'll find code that spans uh, many decades. In uh, numbers, it, creates more, it contains more than 13,000 days of activity. About 1,000 people have contributed to it. This is a timeline of the releases. So early on, there are only snapshots. We don't have precise changes because people were not using a version control repository at that time. Computers weren't powerful enough. But from one point afterwards, we have each change in each file, and we have specific changes. If we look at the, the, how files come, you see here with different colors how files gradually get introduced, and then the contribution is smaller as new additions are coming in. The second source of things I'm using, I want to see the evolution of facilities, and this you cannot see in the source code. So where is the virtual uh, node part of the system? It's difficult to find that. So what I did is I went through the documentation, created a database that records for all parts of the manual when each part, when each page of the manual at first appeared and disappeared. So you can uh, go on GitHub and find a trace of every system call, of every command, of every system administration command, of every library facility, and the releases in which it is documented. Some parts, of course, exist without being documented, and some parts are documented, but don't do exactly work, but you can easily get a rough idea of what happened when, and this is what I used for, to discuss the milestones that we will see today. The third source is a type, I typeset a few manuals that were missing, such as the sec third edition in TROF, in NROF, and the fourth edition in NROF, so I could easily go through them and find important things. Let's now begin by describing the architectural evolution. I will describe this in terms of milestones and also in terms of numbers and insights. And I will begin with milestones. So the things I want you to get to take away from here is how evolution happens in practice over a number of decades. This repository is more than one gigabyte that contains all the history of a, a large important part of Unix history, a project where you can contribute as well if you want to enhance that, and also architectural lessons to apply. So what happened? In the past, these important lessons about what might happen in the future and good and bad things we can do regarding architecture. The architectural part is joint work I've performed with Paris Avgeriu. So, starting with milestones, we said that history begins in, with an unnamed system in the 1970s. And this thing, it wasn't even named Unix at that time, contained a number of very important architectural facilities. It has not survived in digital form, so a group of volunteers have taken printouts such as these, OCR'd them, typed them in, and to verify that it actually worked, made them run on an emulator. Yeah, I think uh, this deserves an applause. <laughs> the kernel itself is extremely small. It's just 2,500 lines of code. Yet, it can load and execute user level commands. It provides a file abstraction, so you can write data into files, named files. It virtualizes the hardware interface. You don't need to know about the paper punch, the tape punch, or about the teletypewriter. And it establishes an ownership of files, so they're already file owners. There's also layering and partitioning. So these are the files. And you see that there are different files for the kernel, different files for commands, where commands more than one file is needed for a command. They are grouped with the same name. The commands will call the kernel. The kernel does not depend on the commands, so there's clear layering here. The commands are not coupled together. And I showed you the partitioning through file name convention. Everything is written in assembly, by the way, .s, right? There is process management. Here is the source code of the fork system call that's still with us today. There is descriptor manager, so the descriptors that we get when we open a file and we use when reading and writing to files are there. There is NF gets and NF put uh, part entry points where you can obtain and release descriptors. There is a separation of file metadata and file naming. You recognize what this is? It's the definition of an inode, the index node which contains the metadata, flags, the user ID, the number of links of the file, the size, but not the name, so that what we can link files together using a different mechanism and establish a hierarchical directories, which were not there at the time, by the way. Devices as files. So there was a system directory, what now is called the dev directory, that contains links to the console, the paper tape, and the second terminal. 
that those were the devices they had on that poor computer. There's also file I.O., so there were open, read, write, seek, and tell system calls, and the file system abstraction, which, where you could create files, rename them, link and unlink. Nowadays, we don't create files. We open them with a create flag, but this is how it worked at the time. There was an interpreter there, at least two commands, an indentation command and a com com command that converts things to lowercase, were written in a language called B, which was implemented through a threaded interpreter. You see here a main, which later became new B, and the main we have in C. After that system, the number of research editions came out that were actually Unix, with name Unix, developed on a PDP-11. The PDP-11 Unix is a complete rewrite of the PDP-7 Unix. So because the assembly language is different, it was written in assembly, they rewrote everything from scratch on computers such as this. This has also not survived, but there was a memo at the laboratories that contained a listing, again, of the source code, a bit better form. You see here various things like the definition of constants, a, a, a link to panic, very important, and uh, so on. And it could, again contained many important architectural innovations. The architecture of the system, I have it in this diagram, is recognizable Unix. So you have user commands, administration commands, a small library, a system call interface, I.O. subsystem, process control subsystem, and some utility functions. I will come back to this diagram later on. The system established a binary API by numbering system calls. So these are the first 10 system calls in the 1972 uh, first edition of Unix. And I've taken those system calls again on the FreeBSD 11.1. You see the same names and even the same numbers. And those of us who are also using Linux, if we go and look at the numbering used for the Linux system calls, which are not derived from the source code, we'll see the same numbers again. It's remarkable that over 50 years, there was a binary API that has survived those many years. At that point, the shell was established as a user program. This is not something we regard this as normal. It was not. If you were working on IBM, the shell belonged to the kernel, and the kernel gods only could modify the shell. In Unix, you can see this documented. The password file contains the program to use as a shell, so anybody could go out, innovate, and create new versions of the shell. It also abstracted standard I.O., so it allowed commands to read from any file and write to any file. Not yet pipes and filters and establish interoperability through documented file formats. So a, a section of the manual documents some file formats. You can see here the documented file formats and clients of each this file format. I find this very interesting because it establishes the use of conventions over configuration. So you don't have a rigid mechanism of how you communicate. You document the format, and you allow anyone to read and write those files with the, with the permissions that are needed, of course. Another very interesting thing is a section six of the manual, which contains user-maintained programs. Some of these programs, such as sort, are now with us as programs that are part of the system. Can anyone guess where these programs were located in the file system? Yes? In the USR, USR directory, exactly. The USR directory we have is the, the user-maintained programs directory. And there was even a mechanism to force their documentation. There was a cron script that was running. And for any command that appeared there in binaries that didn't have a manual page, it was deleted. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we have so good documentation. Things mi migrated from USR to other places, and they were documented. It also established a tree directory structure with the system calls we know and two programs and a number of programs that use them a mountable file system interface. This seems like a luxury for a system that had one, at most, two disks, but it enforces a single tree naming scheme and does away the ugliness of drives and devices, which systems I won't name here are using still to this day. We have seen the diagram of uh, this uh, system. We have a manual page here of the second edition. Now we are moving forward. If we look at this, the, the second edition established a software library. More than 14 of these subroutines that were there exist as functions in the modern C library. So this demonstrates the power of well-chosen utility functions. In the third edition, 
the third edition established the pipes and filters architecture. Interestingly, as an idea, this was put by Doug McIlroy many years before. You see here the date 1964, where he said we need some way of coupling programs like garden hoses so that they, each another signal becomes another process and we can mass massage data, data in this way. This by way of I.O. also. So he said that as we pl plug garden hoses, we should handle I.O. in the same way. Programs at that time could have re redirected the standard input and output, but only like that. At that point, the people behind Unix, the team, went and transformed all programs that took prog file names as arguments into filters. It happened all, only over a few months. Everything was, all, uh, as many programs as possible, were converted into filters. The fourth research edition, so this coincides with the fourth edition of the manual, brought with us a number of things. Structured programming, so programs were not written, and a lot of code was not written in assembly language anymore, but into a language called New B, derived from the B language I showed you earlier on. About 6,000 lines were written in that, and just 700 lines were written in PDP-11 assembly. The system became more modular, so it had about 105 C functions and 50 assembly symbols. Compare that to 250 global symbols in the first edition. By using this language, it became more modular. It gave also, it had a language independent API. Nowadays, we use Unix system calls from all different languages. This is the first time this happened. You see here the pipe system call, which is documented in two ways. As a system call, you can call from assembly, the read file descriptor and register 0, and write file descriptor and register 1. And the system call we can call from C with an array of two integers where you get the read and write, uh, write file descriptors. It established data de structure definition and reuse through header files. Up to that point, anyone who wanted to use some structure just copied that thing into their part of the code and reused that form. Through header files, we have portability. We all can change the definitions and introduce new functionality. Introduced dynamic resource management, uh, so two routines, uh, malloc and m3. These have, don't have anything to do with the malloc and m3 we have in the C library. And these were interestingly used for two purposes, for allocating things in the main memory, core memory, and also in the swap area. So with two maps, with these two routines could allocate part uh, resources in any two of the two. It also introduced a device driver abstraction. Here you see 16 special files. Not many of those do you see today, but there are many interesting ones, such as a photo typesetter and the voice synthesizer, for example, 1970s. And the device driver interface that is still with us and is also something common in uh, Linux and even Windows, this idea of a strategy routine. So we have the open, close, and the strategy routine, and things to read, open, and write to routines, to devices. Introduced a buffer cache to manage, uh, to cache things from the disk into memory. These are some constants for buffer, for bu uh, buffer cache elements. And I found this again still existing with the same name in FreeBSD 11.1. The fifth research edition introduced command files. So th the idea that some parts of the system could be written not in assembly language or in new B or in C, but uh, as shell scripts. So you see here an example of a shell script that compiles some uh, data. The sixth edition is famous as the most widely photocopied and underground transformed system through this description of the sixth uh, edition by John Lyons at the University of New South Wales in Australia. It gave us the portable C library, so a different version of the library aimed at portability, trying to be able to compile in different systems, which, as you can recognize by the names, influence the design of the standard C library that we have with us today. The seventh edition brought many, many important things with us and was the last edition that came out of Bell Labs for a long time. So it introduces Unix as a virtual machine. One problem they had is that they were moving into new hardware and they were finding it difficult to port programs from one hardware to, the, to another. So at some point, as Steve Johnson describes, Dennis Ritchie came to him and said, it might be easier to port Unix to a different piece of hardware than porting each application 
from Unix to a different operating system. So they decided we will use Unix as a virtual machine, as a way to move applications from one different thing to another, from one different hardware platform to another, something we commonly do today. It offered dynamic memory allocation, malloc and free at the C library. This became an instant success. 20 C programs use it, use it at that time, and two library routines use it as well. As well. Introduce static analysis. So the famous lint tool that searches through, not your pockets for lint, but through programs to find pieces of code that are not exactly good, was introduced as a separate program because static analysis is resource heavy. It puts a toll on the compiler, so they decided to put it outside the compiler with the idea of Unix. Each tool should do one thing well. Introduced environment variables. Again, here there's an important part of convention. Environment variables, we write them as key equals value. That's just a convention. There is nothing underneath that requires that to happen. If we don't do it, some things will not work, but uh, it's not a requirement. And it was through modifications of the kernel, the shell, and the C library. Already at the sixth edition, there was YAC, a, a parser generator. It was complemented by YAC, a lexical analyzer generator. And this brought the language development tools. It's completed the language development tools. And 12 clients, 12 programs were written using this idea that you can easily create a small programming language. This evolved into the idea of domain-specific languages, special, small languages that can do one thing very well. Do you want to search through the file system? You write a find predicate. You want to search for lines in a file? You write a regular expression. You want to transform a file? You want to use the M4 microprocessor, and so on and so forth. It also documented the file system directory hierarchy. So there is a manual page, quite long, four pages long, that documents where each place is put. This is important for two reasons. First of all, that we still follow this. Secondly, because it described the self-hosted system. So this hierarchy contained the source code, the development tools, the libraries, the documentation. So the idea that the system is self-hosted, you take it and you can build the same system from source somewhere else. There's no magic thing in the background, a temple where the gods build the system for you. And we utilize this idea day in and day out today. After the sixth edition, Unix went to Berkeley. A group there, the computer science research group, got a copy and started doing research on that. The first and second Berkeley software distributions weren't complete systems. They introduced software packages. So using the established directory hierarchy, and the idea that you can build a, a, a program through a make file, they send out tools such as the C shell, the X editor, which later became VI, Mail, Pascal, and the terminal library. 3BSD, through funding that was given in order to establish a system that could be used for running a research, uh, to be running a research facility, introduced a virtual memory paging. Up to now, Unix could run on a VAX, but it looked at the VAX as a very large address space machine. It did not utilize its visual, visual, virtual memory facilities. It was a big effort, 2,800 lines out of a 160-line uh, kernel, and also introduced a number of special system calls, vread, vwrite, vfork, to take advantage of this. This was a violation of abstraction, and you don't see these calls anymore, it didn't, at least the two first ones, before it is discouraged, because it didn't li live very long. But it shows how easy it is to veer off from the good way of architecture. In 4BSD, two important elements were introduced, like regular expressions. This, we think it's very important, and many scripting languages today live and die by regular expressions, but it proved to be a very hard sell. At the time, there were five different implementations of regular expressions, but when they were introduced, just a single program more was using it. By 4.3 BSD, another two were using it, DBX and RDIST. Today, with a lot of effort from the top programs, Ed, Grab, Sed, and Expert are also using it, which shows that when you introduce some architectural feature late in a system, it is difficult to make it catch and to make it adopted. It also introduced optimized screen handling. At the time, there were a variety of terminals. So you could use a teletype writer, which was developed for sending telegrams, but also for hooking on computers, to a glass CRT terminal. Each one had different peculiarities. So a terminal library was built in order to standardize this. 
We still use this library, so programs that you're using, screen handling programs, still use it, but for a different purpose, for backward compatibility with older systems. 4.2 BSD was extremely important because it brought to us networking, so introduced a number of the internet protocol family. It introduced a socket interface for local and remote interprocess communication, a number of databases that were needed to make the internet work, and the pseudo-terminal driver so you can write program something that looks like a terminal from a program so that you can write a terminal emulator and allow one, one piece of software to talk to another computer as if it is a terminal. The socket interface is controversial, so you see that it was extremely uh, wordy. It uh, introduced uh, a number of, it was used a number of system calls, all these system calls, and you see that not many of them are widely used. This is how each, uh, the programs that are using these system calls. This shows that just being throwing architectural elements in a system isn't always a good idea. The arguments for and against shoehorning the old system calls, so using read, write, open, and close, but maybe this was going over the top. Another interesting version that came out of Berkeley is the Tahoe edition, which supported two CPU architectures, VAX, and the CCI Power 632 architecture. It was not, didn't do very well in the marketplace. Uh, but it allowed the kernel to be split into a device-dependent part, architecture-dependent part, and architecture-independent part. So this is the Tahoe code, machine-dependent code, and the VAX code. This proved to be very useful when Unix was later moved into 386 BSD. The Reno edition introduced a packet forwarding database that gave the idea to router vendors that could use the operating system to write uh, vendors, and the virtual file system interface, so the idea of vNode, which means that you can write different file systems to interface with the system at the vNode interface. So you don't need special code above that layer. All other infra the kernel infrastructure can hook up to any different file system through the vNode interface. The Net2 introduced another interesting facility, the FunOpen. You may know it as FunOpen Cookie in Libsy. How many of you know it? Not many. You see, this is very interesting. It allows you to create a, a file abstract, a file, capital file thing where you can read and write and open and close, and underneath it can be something that you program, with something virtual. Although it's very interesting because it was introduced late, it is not widely used. You can use it to write, read from Internet things, through HTTP, for example, or through compressed files, but it is not something that's widely used. 4.4, one of the last editions that came out of Berkeley, introduced stackable file systems. Again, the idea that you, for example, can stack on top of a CD-ROM, something that you can write on top through the union file system, and the generic system control interface through which you can modify the kernel with syscontrol, uh, with a syscontrol command, a function, and a documented thing that nowadays contains more than 3,000 values. This is something controversial, I think. It still lives in architectural limbo. It's, uh, the interface is undocumented. It could have been hap if it violates the idea that everything in Unix happens through the file system directory hierarchy. And it shows that there are hard architectural de decisions that need to be made, and nobody may know the correct answer. As I said, the split into system dependent, system architecture independent parts allowed a group of people, Bill and Lynn Jolitz, to create 386 BSD, which allowed the system to be used on very cheap hardware that was widely available. And on that, a number of patches were developed because Bill and Lynn Jolitz did not have time to integrate all those things into the system. It established the idea of organized community contributions, that the community can contribute to the system. Up to, now, up to that point, people at Berkeley or at Bell Labs developed the system, but not a community. So it changed Unix from open source software. It had become open source at the time because Berkeley had developed a lot of code that, as government funded, could be openly available, to an open source project where people can contribute. A group of people uh, took that point and uh, worked through FreeBSD. This is the route I will discuss. As I said, OpenBSD and NetBSD are also equally important. Introduced a package manager in, in FreeBSD that allowed other packages, other compilers, utilities, and so on, to be introduced and used by the system 
through patches in the source code, compilation, instruction, installation, and installation, and the handling of, de of, de of dependencies. This allows the system to grow without burdening the base system. Up to that point, every new utility was part of the base system, but nowadays with thousands of ports, this could not continue. FreeBSD2 introduced the PROC file system to uh, see various things of, regarding a process. Again, tension here between system calls that get process information and getting process information through the file system hierarchy. And dynamically loadable kernel modules. In three, FreeBSD3, we have the common access method subsystem, so I think a way to abstract all the functionality needed to access storage devices. A kernel networking and user library, NetGraph, that allows us to build protocols through a data flow model. FreeBSD 4 introduced and brought the OpenSSL secure socket layer part, which is the idea that you bring a large collection of software. This is big, so more than 1,000 files, more than 200,000 lines of code, with many, a lot of functionality in the library level and a very rich user level command uh, that allows you to use it. In FreeBSD 5, you see that the version numbers are going fast now. We have the modular I.O. disk request transformation framework, GEOM, that allows you to virtualize and decrypt at various levels of functionality to file systems. In 5.3, we have a streaming archive access library, mini port data driver. In 7, we have the ZFS file systems. In 7.1, dynamic tracing, the G-Trace toolkit. In 8, the packet capture library was introduced that allows user-level programs to manipulate packets. And in 9, there was InfiniBand high-speed interconnect library introduced. Again, you see quick succession of versions and relatively few major architectural additions. I can discuss this later. So let's move now to our observations, not regarding our milestones, but regarding numbers and insights. On the number side, we see a large increase in size from a few thousand lines to millions of lines. What does, has, has this meant in terms of modularity? We see that the modularity has increased with code size so that people tried to keep modularity at a, a constant set through the introduction of static declarations, for example, through the use of hash include directives, and so on. At some points, complexity rose, but it followed the self-correcting path. So number of files per function increased and then started decreasing. The nesting of statements, if, else, then while, and another if in between, increased and then decreased again. The density of C preprocessor or non-include directives, which can make the code very difficult to follow, again follows this self-correcting path. Even the go-to function became less and less used. There is a way to count this called cyclomatic complexity, essentially the number of branches that happen within a function, and they see this decreasing within the kernel, the libraries, and the tools. I find this remarkable because there is no dictator there saying, you shall decrease your cyclomatic complexity. It happens through a very rich and varied community, as if an individual force is guiding it, perhaps Lehman's laws of software evolution. How do facilities grow over that time? As I said, I could, we could trace it by looking at the manual pages. So we see a continuous growth in the number of commands, Three phases in system calls, so it seems that every time the system moves from one place to another, from research labs to Berkeley and then to open source, it changed the way system calls were constant or increasing nowadays. The same with the C library, so constant followed by growth. A constant growth in the number of devices, this is expected because the hardware industry is constantly innovating and giving us new devices or forcing us to buy new devices. A stopped growth in the number of documented file formats. Perhaps they are no longer serving us. Software is becoming too complex today to document it through a file format such as password or etc. groups. A constant growth in the number of system commands, so in system administration evolution is still happening. And the growth in the kernel interfaces, so things are happening behind the scenes. Regarding observations on the insights side, so can, what can we say on the quality of these changes, not the numbers? I see the following things. One very important thing, the importance of conventions over rigid enforcements. There are other systems that force you to go a specific way. 
they have APIs, strict large APIs, Byzantine complexity, where you create very, very difficult data structures to do something. In Unix, the preferred way of working is to establish a convention and politely ask the pe people to follow it. We see that in file identifier naming from the early beginning, add1.s, add2.s, the environment variables, the C calling conventions, the idea of prefixing C, fun C functions with an underscore, where files are located. Continuous evolution. So evolution has stopped. It continues to this day. I showed how things were introduced over the recent versions of FreeBSD. However, I've also seen a slowdown, and we've seen it, of architectural evolution. So we, we see that fewer major important facilities are added over time. Maybe it's difficult to make a big architectural change when we are dealing with a system of tens of millions of lines of code. How do you make an architectural impact? Or maybe it's difficult to change a system. It's as if you have a ship, a big ship that you need to turn, and it's difficult to make it turn. We see a wide influence of its internal design. So even internal design features that are not documented can influence and survive over decades. We show that with how the, the internal device driver abstractions have moved and are used even by other systems. The case of character and block device switch, the strategy routine, which can be found in Linux. There are also features that can be added and not used. We saw, we, we saw that with regular expressions, file streams, the stackable file systems. So architecture is not an easy task. It can be a thankless task as well. We also saw that architectural features change role over time. These are the bones of a human, a dog, a bird, and a whale. So we saw that the cursor's library, for example, was initially introduced in order to provide compatibility between various terminals. Now we're not using terminals anymore. We're using terminal emulators. And it's used now not for compatibility purposes, but for providing backwards compatibility with uh, all the programs that were written for the varied terminals. There's also the idea of inadvertent technical debt. So architectural decisions that appear reasonable at a specific time can turn out to be suboptimal. When the socket interface was established, there was the idea of socket streams and datagram abstractions. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but we know that the internet moved in specific directions. Vendor-specific implementations are not used, and now we're using the open internet standards rather than the ISO standards, for example. The importance of portability as a shaping force. So many times along its history, Unix was moved from one architecture to another. And so what um, Dennis Richard described, we want a system that, first of all, is easily portable unchanged, but can also be easy to change to move it and take advantage of different hardware uh, architectures and power of, archi of power of hardware. This influenced the design of the system, the C programming language, and also the whole architecture of Unix. Then we saw competition between alternative architectural styles. So the competition between system calls, such as ptrace, getr usage, and getr limit, and the file system interface that provides similar access facilities. We also saw the preservation of architectural form. So I showed you this diagram of the first edition. Have a look at it. Now squint your eyes and look at the modern FreeBSD 11.0. Architectural form has remained stable, especially in areas where technologies haven't evolved. The colors you see in this part are still available in this system. Everything that's colored with the same color is still the same. Or maybe the initial architecture was very well thought out. Could be a platonic architectural truth, a truth that that system adopted and similar systems have adopted as well. The diagram also points us to the growth of federated architecture, so a number of architectures now have their own, live in their own boxes, such as OpenSSL, Git, Geom, CAM, NetGraph. You no longer influence the direction of the whole system, but you build your own federation of architectures. And finally, the idea of having individuals with imagination, with creativity, to come up with powerful abstractions, the taste to select the most appropriate abstractions, and the energy to implement them. This brings me to the end of the presentation. At this point, I wish you to go out and architect something great. Thank you very much.